How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Last Thumbs. This is Please Go Play, the series where I fully endorse specific games that I believe are truly unique experiences and generally worthy of your time. It's structured like a typical review, but you get to know up top that the games featured in this series are approximate 10 out of 10s from me, and that if you were to go no further in this video, I'm telling you right now, I think you should buy this game. In this installment, I'm featuring the recent Iris and the Giant, which combines a collectible card game foundation with turn-based strategic gridded combat, rogue light runs, and RPG mechanics of progression. At first, I thought the game would play more like Slay the Spire, but there's no branching paths of dungeon advancement, and the combat is less about overpowering your enemies with upgrades and damage output, and instead is more about managing a grid of oncoming enemies that can often be taken down in a single stroke. So even though at a glance the card-based gameplay looks familiar, I want you to put Slay the Spire out of your mind, as the similarities are superficial at most. This is not a clone, and it is definitely not trying to be. Instead, our main character, young Iris, climbs one floor at a time and faces off against a themed group of enemies that operate in a grid. Most enemies are built to be dispatched in a single blow, but this is balanced by you typically only being able to play one card per turn. You hack and weave your way through. Each time you clear the front of the line, everything advances one space forward until a path to the stairs opens up. It's then your choice to grind more loot or flee to the next level. There are a multitude of considerations to be made, which honestly becomes a running theme through the entire game. If we look at some of your more standard card options, swords only attack the front row while arrows attack the first and second row. You alternate taking turns, but it's very heavily in favor of the enemies. You get to play your one card, and then every single one of them that's able to plays theirs. Enemies are usually quite one note in the actions they take, so it makes pre-planning a little bit easier since there's a real possibility that two entire rows of enemies are going to attack you all at once, you're going to want to do your best to mitigate damage by keeping enemies out of range. It's much easier said than done. You usually only have the ability to target one enemy at a time, and some of them are going to come shielded, taking more than one hit to finish off. Or disposing of that weak enemy puts something more difficult in your wake. Some enemies might duck and hide, and you're only able to hit them every other turn. Others will insert unwanted cards into your deck that limit your options or have more direct negative effects. Perhaps they explode when reaching the front row, necessitating that you either shoot them out of range or shield yourself. The game does a fantastic job of providing enough variety of offense and defense on both sides of the battle that you'll regularly need to switch up your tactics to adapt. The foundations of the game are established in such a simple manner, yet there's such an insane number of exceptions, combinations, and expansions of the various rules of both your cards and the enemy's capabilities. A few examples, you are allowed to play as many swords as you have in your hand, allowing you to slice and dice a multitude of enemies if you get a lucky draw. Daggers will ignore armor for auto kills. An axe can sweep an entire row, while fireballs penetrate three deep. Giving new meaning to balls deep? Should I keep that joke in? <laughs> You can also heal using your very limited confidence cards without using up a turn, or instead choose to hunker down and shield all attacks if things are getting too sketchy. In the same manner, enemies become increasingly more complex beyond standard attacks and defenses. Eventually, you'll encounter those that are immune to all but magic, while others will actually reflect magic damage back at you. There are thieves that will steal away your cards, and others that permanently lower your max health. Occasionally, you'll encounter boss-type enemies that will turn the tide and need your immediate attention. This big skeleton gives a couple of grunts and rallies the enemies, so they attack twice per turn. Each. The three Cerberus dogs all need to be defeated together or else they keep respawning. In addition to that, they each have shields that need to be shattered. Certain advancements of the levels are predetermined. When exactly you reach this two-lane wide dank caves that completely changes things, or a more cat-heavy level or these fiery steeps will happen in a specific order, but the exact combination of enemies and bosses will be randomized for a new experience each time. There's a beautiful accessibility here that runs throughout, with the true complexity of the game slowly unfolding over time. This allows the player to learn valuable lessons and more easily keep up with the difficulty curve. The more you play the game, the wider the variety of possible cards to play with becomes. And in the same fashion, additional enemies will begin appearing throughout the maps. Suddenly introducing new weapons and enemy types gives you a twofold need to alter your approach. Your new lightning card that attacks all enemies of a single species may seem overpowered, 
but that likely means a magic immune variant of several species will likely start appearing. Eventually, you have these spiky-headed guys who throw down bear traps that snap on you when they reach the front, but you can use the whip to activate them and instead snap shut on the enemy units. Or, these fire-based enemies that will burn your cards, making them cost life to play. But, if you defeat one of these enemies, they actually burst like your fire magic and kill other enemies in the column behind them. The game progresses in this equal but opposite manner, meaning that what you learned last run will be helpful, but things have changed just enough to stop you from sailing through. In each additional run, you're likely to make it a little bit further into the game, but there's constantly going to be new setbacks to test your skills. I think this was a brilliant choice that makes one of the most effective difficulty curves I've ever experienced. The balance of introducing new obstacles and new solutions simultaneously gives you a sense of game mastery and understanding, even when a particular run doesn't go so well. Iris and the Giant is deeply strategic, and its gridded battles require you to plan ahead. The Tetris-like advancement of enemies provide you with the opportunity to anticipate upcoming challenges and manage your opponents accordingly. All of this, and I haven't even gotten into the greatest managerial concern of all. Your deck of cards works as a secondary health pool. If your health, or will, reaches zero, you obviously lose. Or, if your deck of cards dwindles to zero, you also lose. That doesn't sound too tricky, does it? Well, each card played is gone for good. Not to mention enemies that will hinder your deck or steal cards away. You're going to need to constantly raid chests and find any means of acquiring cards. Occasionally, this means a trade-off of foregoing powerful upgrades and bonuses to try and keep the game going a few turns longer during a particularly lengthy or grueling showdown. That feels like a perfect segue to talk about the various methods of upgrading in this game. Besides opening up chests on the board and claiming cards, you can also improve your stats and acquire means of altering and adding new mechanics. Off to the side here, you'll see that there are both star and gem tallies being kept. As gems appear on the board, they can be harvested as a free action, although you may choose to only harvest a fraction of them to hold an enemy at bay. Stars are instead accumulated with each enemy defeated. Stars allow you to upgrade one of your traits but also provide the opportunity to claim cards if needed. You can diversify your skill set or invest it all in one particular trait. Gems, on the other hand, simply provide a new means of adding additional cards to your deck. Some of these traits could include making shields last three turns instead of two, or increasing daggers range from one to two. Or maybe you invest in something that aids in your card management, with every twelfth card returning to your deck once played. Defeating these mini-bosses also results in the drops of these extra magical abilities that add even more variety to this already bursting at the seams game. Not to mention all the ridiculous combinations that take place, weird intricacies of stealing cards from your enemies, layering together a multitude of combinations, and ways of playing the game that lead to other secret areas, access points, and modifiers to make your next run all the more fun. Stars and gems are the two methods for upgrading in a given run, which will not carry forward after you lose. Or maybe I should say if you lose, but that's the roguelite of the game. Now how about some of the more permanent RPG-like progressions? Maybe that still qualifies as roguelite, but the way you can swap them out and mix and match them does have a little bit more of an RPG quality. These golden diamonds found during a run are memories, and can be spent in the main menu after to add new abilities to Iris, while imaginary friends can be unlocked and swapped out to aid you on your quest. After some of your runs, the game may provide you with challenges that must be completed to access these imaginary friends. I really love this, since it forces you to think through the game differently. This incentive to try new strategies will yield these friends, and may also teach you something about the game you hadn't previously considered. Finding a new viable combination that you underutilized previously. Here I am gushing about the fresh gameplay and the head-scratching strategy, yet I haven't even gotten into the true heart of the game. In a beautiful opening cutscene that blends minimalist animation, paper craft worlds, and watercolor flourishes, we are introduced to a character suffering from anxiety and depression. The climb through dank caves and fiery pits acts as an imaginary world, with Iris fighting her personal demons. In between specific levels, we get new snippets of Iris's journey as she climbs up these steps, and through the discovery of the previously mentioned memories, the character, her world, and experiences are all expanded upon, allowing us to better understand her struggles. A small detail I really enjoyed are all the tool tips and descriptions in the game, which distinctly separate Iris as the main character and us as the player, using I and you pronouns. We are someone participating in this adventure to help Iris along the way. In a way, we may even 
even be yet another one of her imaginary friends, helping her cope with the real world. And before anyone worries too much about these deeper themes, the game is considered child-friendly. Don't mistake the game for being goofy or immature, but it is instead accessible in the way that it tackles these heavy topics in a more relatable manner. Incorporating an emotional narrative into either a card game or a roguelike is something that isn't often seen, and I greatly appreciate how deftly it was handled here. I know some people may be a little put off by, ooh, another indie game about the developer's depression, but I think this one is unique in the sense that you are playing alongside a character who's depressed. The game isn't forcing you to project yourself onto this character and try to relate with them. Instead, you join the character on their journey and grow a deep empathy for them. I feel like that's a far better way to truly bring the player into such a difficult narrative. Iris and the Giant is solo developer Louis Rigaud's latest addition to his catalog of books and animated movies, and interactive mediums of all sorts. His ambitions are that of creating engaging and often thought-provoking pieces that are meant for all ages. His website states, My work often offers an educational dimension. During my studies, I learned to design images for a pedagogical purpose, whether for kids in children's publishing or for adults on popularization of science projects. I really respect that philosophy behind his work and admire his ability to work in so many different mediums. That range of creativity is what allowed him to make this game all on his own and made it feel like a very personal project in ways that go beyond the narrative of depression and anxiety. This jack-of-all-trades mentality may have also aided him in making some of these very intricate and effective game design choices. There are some planned updates for the game that will hopefully optimize things a little further. It maybe seems to be a bit of a ram suck at the moment, as well as some expanded content and general balancing. But it's not an early access. In its current state, the game is incredibly worth your time and money. It's a fantastic strategy game, innovative blend of genres, and has a powerfully emotional core to it. If you love more tactical, deck-building genres, or story-rich games, then I think this game is something you should try. And I personally think the art style will appeal to anyone, feel I shouldn't even have to sell anyone on that, you should have a good picture of it already through this video. I would recommend it to almost anyone, but if it checks off more than one box for you, it really is a must play. I have greatly enjoyed my own time with it, and plan to keep playing it at least until I 100% things, which after quite a few hours, still seems like a pretty far off goal. Primarily combining two genres that have felt so overcrowded in recent years, a game that's been able to capture my attention like this was really an unexpected delight. So please, go play Iris and the Giant. Thank you guys so much for watching. A quick shout out to patrons and members of the channel. It means so much that you would donate. If you're unable to commit anything monetarily yourself, then please leave a comment that does actually help an insane amount. YouTube really supports highly engaged videos. So yeah, genuinely your comments do help. YouTubers don't just say that just cause. If you're interested in more videos like this in the end cards here, I'll have a link to the please go play playlist. If you see this video on release, that playlist is gonna be this video and one other. Hopefully someday I'll be able to add more. And the other end card will be my own first look at this game over on the Let's Play channel. Once again, thank you guys all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.